It's Steve, that old Yorkshire gig, and it's list time. Huzzah! Right, this time... I don't know why I paused then, but whatever. This time, it's ten Star Trek debates that tear the fandom apart. This is a list uh, that has been compiled by uh, what culture, or is it Trek culture, whatever they call themselves. Sean Ferrick has done the... Uh, has done this list. Right, so... Uh, before we start though, don't forget to like and subscribe and share the videos, drop a comment, hit the notification bell if you subscribed already. Um, explore the description for links for Patreon, merch, me books, etc. Uh, and all that stuff. So have a look down there. Uh, become a member um, uh, and, and you'll get early access stuff, such as this video will be early access uh, for members only. Um, and uh, what else? Um, super thanks. Throw a super thanks my way as well. Uh, it would be much appreciated. Is that it? Right, okay, let's get on with it, shall we? Um, let's have a look at this list. Right, there it is. Ten Star Trek debates that tear the fandom apart. I've not read them, by the way. I'm going in cold. I nearly said something else then. <laughs> but... Uh, Let's uh, have a read of what these. So I'm, I'm going to. I'm sure they will. You know, Sean Ferrick and the Trek Culture team will have their, their um, opinions, and I will have my opinions, and I'll let you know what my opinion is. Right. So there's Star Trek Legacy. Look, which is not going to happen. I'm, I'm holding out hope that maybe it will. Still got that mid 2025 number that I just plucked out of the ether. Um, maybe for an announcement. I don't know, but we'll see. Right, here we go. In any fandom, there are those passionate folks who will go out of their way to defend their positions. Trek culture is no stranger to this, nor are we innocent. Nobody's innocent, mate. We believe what we believe, uh, and so does other people, and we do our best to offer a balanced argument to support said beliefs. The differences through the fandom often show their hands in how these arguments are handled. Two or more may stand on opposite sides of the aisle, having an impassioned discussion as to whether Kirk or Picard are the better captain. But as long as it remains on either side, then it's simple discourse. Every so often something will come along that will whip people into a frenzy. Sadly, many of these frenzies can quickly devolve into slanging matches. God being human. With all reason debate, leaving the room as quickly as someone can say, Not a real fan! Who... What is the definition of a real fan? The goalpost as to what qualifies one as a real fan often change mid-argument as well. There you go. Especially when one combatant realises that their position is less secure than they might like. Um, like I said, it doesn't matter, does it, really, in the, the grand scheme of things. Uh, if you stick to your guns, fair enough. If you're willing to say... Oh yeah, maybe I'm wrong, or you know, maybe I should um, soften my view slightly, and you know, whatever. It's up to you, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, this article is not designed to paint any position within reason. Racism, for example, being a non-negotiable topic, as it should be. Uh, why just racism, for example? I suppose, as more or less correct than any other. There are plenty of commenters who will do that without our help. Here we will focus on the catalyst for many of these debates. But speaking of racism, um, it depends on your definition of racism, doesn't it? Some people say some things are racist, and other, you know, some people will say, well, no, that's not racist because it doesn't talk about a race. Um, you know, all other things. Uh, you know, if, if you call somebody, say from Scotland, I'm from England, of course I'm from Scotland, you know, call them a, a name, you know, uh, oh, you're a right jock, you know, because a jock is a, a, a nickname for Scottish people. Doesn't matter, oh, you're being racist against Scottish people. No, Scottish people are a race. They're a part of the UK, you know, they're, they're not... There's one race, that's what I'm trying to say, there's the human race. Anyway, whatever. Right, so, number 10, we're off. Number 10, Tuvix. Um not a fan of this episode. I'm really not a fan of this episode of uh, of Voyage. A lot of people like it uh, and like the character of Tuvix and don't like what Janeway did. But it's one of these. There's no right answer, is there? There's no correct resolution. It's a. It's essentially it's a Kobayashi Maru, isn't it? But let's see what uh, Sean says. Um, 
spelling mistake straight away. The mere mention, their mere mention, whatever. The mere mention of the name Tuvix is usually enough to inflame social media for a few days, with the usual arguments centred on whether or not Captain Janeway was justified in her actions. As most will know, Tuvix was the result of a transporter accident that fused Tuvok and Neelix seemingly forever, till it was discovered the accident could be reversed. Good old transporters. Though this would save the two men, it was certain death for Tuvix, who was a fully sentient being, one intent on staying alive. Uh, have a little drink here. <sighs> Consider the arguments. Who had the greater right to live? Two men who had gone into a transporter just like any other day. Uh, these men had friends, families, responsibilities. They were living, breathing beings. Surely they had the greater right to live. Next there is Tuvix himself. His, uh, he is a being created accidentally, yet is no less sentient than the other two. He quickly assumed duties aboard Voyager, and thanks to Tom Wright's excellent performance, displays a grand depth of emotional understanding. Uh, because, you know, it became like a melding of Tuvix's logic and Neelix's... Um, affability, I suppose you could say. Uh, let us be clear, sending Tuvix back into the transporter is an execution, despite it being one for the best possible reasons. It's the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, essentially, isn't it? By simple definition, Janeway is guilty of murder. Depends how you look at it. As I said, nothing's black and white, is it? We all have his opinions. Something Lower Decks poked fun at in their fourth season opener, Tuvix. She's also a lifesaver, returning both Tuvok and Neelix to life as they knew it. Much of the discourse focuses on this element. While other voices speak of right to life and anti-corporal punishment, the, this is a topic where there is no clear correct answer. As I said, it's a Kobayashi Maru in it. Every turn seems to have at least some merit. It is therefore hardly a surprise that there can be little consensus on the matter. Exactly, exactly. Um, I think she did the right thing. Uh, because you're talking about two people uh, whose lives have been essentially destroyed, uh, Tuvok and Neelix, um, and although two Tuvix did sh did have their uh, memories, I suppose you could say, um, they weren't. You know, he wasn't Tuvok and he wasn't Neelix, was he? He was Tuvix, uh, and they needed both Tuvok and Neelix. They didn't need two Vix, uh, in my opinion. But as I said, it's not a, it's not a black and white argument, is it? It's um, the, 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 it's a, it's a grey area, isn't it? Um, did did Jamie do it just for selfish reasons? Because Tuvok were her friend and she wanted him back. Neelix was as well, but Tuvok was an old friend. Who knows? Who knows? So there we go. So straight off, we're uh, kind of in disagreement, or well, not disagreement, but. As they're saying, agreeing that there's little consensus. It can go either way, can't it? Uh, but I think she did the right thing. I think Jane Way did the right thing. Uh, as I said, the needs of the many. So you sacrifice one life to get two back. It's simple math, as you say over the pond. <laughs> right, moving on, number nine. Here we go. Number nine, the Kelvin Universe. There's Chris Pine as uh, as young Kirk uh, with his um, starship salt shaker. Right, Star Trek is dead. In 2009, Star Trek exploded onto screens with a flurry of lens flares, fast-moving ships, faster-moving people, and a bombastic score that fit the mood. That was, the, that was one of the few things that were actually really good about um, the... J.J. Uh, Abrams, the Kelvin verse films. Michael Giacchino's a really good composer. I'm not sure about his directing abilities, but that's a different matter. Uh, this came four years after the cancellation of Star Trek Enterprise, a show with considerably less lens flares, uh, and seven years after the poor box office that Star Trek Nemesis received, which I, I like Star Trek Nemesis, and I still think it's got the best space battle in Star Trek. In terms of Hollywood, it is a little bit remarkable that such a big budget endeavour was gambled on a franchise that had, for all intents and purposes, died. Rebooting familiar properties is also... Les Moonves killed Star Trek. Um, and then he did it again when he gave Alex Kurtzman unlimited power before leaving, or before getting fired himself. But anyway... 
Rebooting familiar properties is also some, something of a safe bet for movie studios that want more return than risk. But Star Trek had never truly dazzled at the box office, despite some impressive returns from the one with the whales. So a complete Star Trek Four. So a complete tonal shift was employed to make it more marketable to the summer blockbuster crowd. Therein lay the first line that some Trekkies struggled to cross. How could this film, so utterly different in look and feel, truly be a part of the overall franchise? I don't think it is. Um, I know it's another universe. That's that's how it. That's its get out clause. It's a. It's an alternate universe. That's how they get round it. I just wish they hadn't shoehorned Spock into it. Poor Leonard Nimoy. Anyway, having Star Trek exist within its own continuity was a wide. Uh, wise move, and this is Star Trek. They're on about the 2009. Having Star Trek 2009 exist within its own continuity was a wise move, even if that stoked more anger from those who wished to see the existing universe more fully explored. Casting Leonard Nimoy certainly helped allay some of those fears, as there are few more recognisable ears in sci fi. So I'm getting angry already. I don't like the film. I, don't, I tried to like it. I was really looking forward to it. Uh, when, I saw, when I saw the trailers and stuff, I thought, wow, this is going to be amazing. And then it wasn't. <laughs> um, but anyway. While there is little doubt that financially at least J.J. Abrams' gamble paid off, did it? The Kelvin Universe films remain hotly contested in the fandom. I don't think it did pay off. I think it had like a $160 million budget, something like that. And um, uh, I think it only grossed like 300 and something million. So I think, did that technically lose money? I don't know. Uh, I might be misremembering. If I remember, <laughs> if I remember, I should know these down sometimes. If I remember, I'll try and put a, a little caption, I don't know, there or something, about the cost and grosses of Star Trek 2009. Anyway. Uh, there are those who drink them up gladly, while others simply tolerate their existence. There are those who simply ignore them, while more vehemently decry their existence, resolutely stating that Abrams and co. attempted to murder the franchise. I don't think they attempted to murder the franchise, I think they kind of manslaughtered it. <laughs> Um, with the years passing and little hope of Star Trek IV on the horizon, it seems as though this one argument, at least... Um, oh, sorry... If I learn to read, I'll start again. While the years, uh, with with the years passing, a little hope of Star Trek fought on the horizon. It seems as though this is one argument, at least, that may be conf confined to three films and a couple of television references. I'll learn to read one of these days. Um, yeah, I don't like the the Kelvin Star Trek. Star Trek Beyond didn't mind it. I like the story of it, but. It did have big problems. And I don't like the fact that J.J. Abrams knows sod all about science fiction, or at least making science fiction believable. Ver uh, verisimilitude, he knows sod all about that. If it looks cool on screen, that's all he cares about. Um, but uh, that's, why, that's, why, that's why he essentially ruined Star Wars. Um, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, so... I don't know what they're saying here. What, what's Trek Culture's what is Trek Culture's opinion on Star Trek 2009? They're not really saying it, have they? Is Sean? Um, does he like it? Does he not like it? I don't know. He doesn't seem to have an opinion on this. He's been a bit. Uh, leave it up to you. Uh, whereas I don't like Star Trek 2009, or especially Into Darkness. Star Trek Beyond. I can watch it, but. It, there are bits in it that do my nutting, but uh, anyway, I suppose the same could be said about Star Trek 2009, but um, that just annoys the hell out of me. Uh, anyway, moving on, let's see what's next, but uh, Star Trek's not dead, by the way, uh, it'll never die, because we've got classic Trek to fall back on, uh, we can always watch that, um, that's what I always tell myself. Right, what's next, uh, why am I down there? Uh, number eight, Prime Universe versus Discovery. Uh, this is it. Some people think Discovery is supposed to be in the Prime Universe, isn't it? But some people say, well, it, it can't be because it's changed so much stuff. Um, but the same could be argued about Enterprise, couldn't it? But uh, anyway, uh, 
Right, Brian Fuller and Alex Kurtzman, the latter of whom worked on the Kelvin films, uh, the former of whom worked on the 90s and uh, uh, arts era shows. Uh, Brian Fuller worked on, um, I think, did he work on Voyager and Enterprise? I think it was them two, wasn't it? Uh, and Alex Kurtzman, along with Roberto Artsy, co wrote the Kelvin Universe, well, the first two Kelvin Universe films. Um, developed the idea for this prequel series, Star Trek Discovery. The word prequel alone is enough to fuel some fires, with an argument being why go backwards to tamper with established history when one can go forwards and create more? Exactly. The same argument had been levelled against Enterprise when it was announced in 2001, but at least Enterprise tried to explain things. It made mistakes with the Klingons. I think, to be honest, I think they thought, soddy, we'll have the Klingons looking like they're doing TNG. Then there were a big fan outcry saying they shouldn't do. So, but we had to wait until season four for an explanation. But uh, anyway, I love Enterprise. I think it's amazing. Um, yet Discovery went one step, well, several steps. Uh, we'll come to that further. Their main character was the previously unheard of sister of Spock. And that's just shoehorning in member berries and connections that shouldn't exist. Making Michael Burnham again, why call her Michael? It's just gonna, it's just gonna tick people off, isn't it? I mean, Mike. I mean, you do have some names that can be, you know, used for both sexes. Um, Alex, for example, that's the, probably the most popular one, isn't it? Um, but why pick Michael? Don't know. Anyway. Uh, making Michael Burnham the adopted sister of Spock puzzled the fandom. To put it mildly, how would she fit into established canon? Why had we never heard of her before? There were those who were quick to point out that no one has, had heard of Cybok until more than 20 years after he had been introduced to Spock. Uh, we had been introduced to Spock, sorry. So who knew how many children were running around out there? It's a good point, I suppose. Um... And they do try to explain it in the series, but again, it's kind of, you know, crowbarred in there, awkwardly. Uh, then that image of those Klingons having lunch was released and the conversations erupted. Yeah, because we, we were saying, no, they can't be Klingons. People were saying, that's the Klingons. They said, no, they can't be, there must be something else. And it turned out they were Klingons and they looked bloody awful. Uh, but the same could be said about Star Trek, the motion picture, when we saw Klingons in that. They were totally different from the series, weren't they? Uh, six or one and a half a dozen of the other, isn't it? But at least Enterprise explained it or tried to explain it. Well, no, it didn't try to. It did. It explained why Klingons got smooth foreheads. Anyway. Even now, seven years, five seasons and a time jump later, the debate about which universe Discovery exists in rages on. Uh, it signalled the beginning of an aesthetic shift in Star Trek that seemed to actively disregard what had come before, as well as upgrading technology that, according to strict canon, simply shouldn't have existed in that time. Exactly. The violence of the show's first season riled people, as well as the dour overall tone. I liked the first season of Discovery, because it was new and different, and I thought, well, I'll give it a chance, and I did quite enjoy it. I thought season one of Discovery was... I think it was Head and Shoulders better than season one of The Orville. They were kind of running at about the same time, weren't they? Um, the Orville, I found The Orville season one quite annoying, to be completely honest. It didn't know what it wanted to be, uh, did The Orville. Was it a comedy? Was it Star Trek sci-fi? I don't think it had decided. Then in season two, it made up its mind what it was going to be, didn't it? And season two was amazing of The Orville. Um, but Discovery kind of went downhill really quickly uh, after season one. But anyway, um, uh, Discovery's first season was polarising. The argument as to its place in canon has by no means faded, but the arrival of four new shows, one of which being a direct spin-off from Discovery, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which I really like, even though that is messing with canon in a big way. It's moved the eugenics wars and can sort of like move them back into, not back, but you know what I mean? How do you explain it? I get confused with this. It's moved them, it's not moved them forward in time, because that would mean they happened earlier, wouldn't it? But you know what I mean? But it's not moved them back into timey wimey. It's moved them to a later date. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, 
Well, well, with more on the way, has diluted some of the argument. Um, yeah, like I said, lower decks. I didn't like it at first, uh, but I muddled through, and then I love lower decks now, and I'm sad to see it go. Uh, Star Trek Picard, two, first two seasons were absolutely terrible. Season three were okay. It wasn't as good as everybody's making it out to be. I don't think it was, but it was okay. I didn't mind it, and I would like to see that continue, that arc continue into Star Trek Legacy. Don't like what they did with the Titan. That shouldn't have been changed to the Enterprise, but never mind. Even some of the people involved in making shows like The Next Generation, Voyager and Enterprise have come out to say that they, they consider it an alternate, ta uh, if I can read, an alternate timeline. Now that the show has completed its run, we, the audience, have entered into our post-mortem phase. Much like Enterprise before it, it is receiving reappraisals. What might the discourse be in 5, 10 or 15 years? It's still crap. <laughs> Star Trek Discovery is, 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 a, is terrible. It is genuinely terrible. Um, apart from season one, as I said, which I quite enjoyed. Um, it, it did have huge, huge problems, but I still kind of enjoyed it. Uh, and, and the best thing about season two were Pike. Um, that um, is kind of... It's kind of got annoying now in Strange New Worlds, to be completely honest. It's more about his hair than anything. Um... But uh, but they tried to change Discovery, didn't they? That, oh, it's a prequel. It, why is it changing all this stuff and giving Klingons two knobs and stuff like that? And that's not what that, no. Klingons haven't got two of everything. They've got redundancies, uh, so they're like harder to kill. But uh, anyway, um, and they heal quicker, more quickly um, because of these redundancies. They don't have two of everything. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, all right, but then uh, at the end of at the end of season two, yeah, at the end of season two, wasn't it? They went into the future, even though they didn't have to. <laughs> really bad storytelling in Star Trek Discovery as well. It's as though I'd written it. But uh, anyway, but I don't think the discourse will change. I think in ten, five, ten, fifteen years, people will still be saying Star Trek Discovery is not very good. I think that's what we'll be saying. It'll still have its fans. Um, because there's always fans of something. The worst thing ever made of have fans. But um, the, they will be few and far between, in my opinion. Right, moving on to number seven. Uh, right, number seven, Star Trek Picard Season 3. Here we go. Um, I, I liked it. Thought it were okay. Didn't love it like everybody else seemed to. Not everybody, but you know what I mean. Um, but it were, it were good to see... To see familiar faces again, and that. Right, the glorious return of the Next Generation crew was met with near universal acclaim upon the release of Star Trek Picard's third season. Uh, this was a complete shift from the first two seasons of the show, both of which had met with mixed reviews, with some of the discourse focusing on the tonal shifts from the Next Generation, while others felt the lack of familiar elements was the issue. The inclusion of the Discovery era Constitution class ship in the show's second episode did little to quell these fires. Did it? Honestly, can't remember. Um, honestly, can't remember because uh, it was that bad. Was that at Picard? Season one and two were terrible. Um, um, because it was it was it was Patrick Stewart's sorry Sir Patrick Stewart's um, vanity project. He didn't want any of the others involved and they had to basically twist his arm to get like Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis in in season one, didn't they? Uh, and Terry Metallus had to get him drunk for him to agree to have the rest of the, the TNG uh, crew uh, back in it. But anyway, um, I've, I've kind of gone off Patrick Stewart. I used to really like him because he's, he's from my area. Uh, he's a Yorkshireman. Uh, born not like two miles from where I live, um, but um, I've kind of gone off him because he's he's been he's been corrupted by the Hollywood machine, uh, in my opinion. But anyway, so the Terry Metallus helmed third season seemed to listen to all of these criticisms and take them on board. We had far more familiar-looking starships. Yes, we did. The, the thing about Star Trek Discovery uh, and Star Trek Picard seasons one and two. Um, Whoever they've got designing their starships just doesn't know anything about Star Trek because they look awful. 
They don't look like proper Starfleet ships. Uh, or even Klingon ships. The Klingon ships in Star Trek Discovery Season 1 uh, look terrible. Look terrible. Uh, didn't look anything like we'd seen in um, the original series. And the same went for the um, the Federation ships, the Starfleet ships. Um, the the Shenzhou well, they were a nice looking ship, but it didn't look like it came before um, you know the, the Enterprise, the, the original Enterprise. You know, it looked far too new, even though it was supposed to be an old ship. Uh, and its bridge were in the wrong place. For some reason, they decided just for shits and giggles, sorry for swearing. Uh, to put the bridge underneath, on the underside of the saucer section, which makes no sense whatsoever, but anyway. <sighs> where that? Uh, anyway, where were we? Um, I forgot where I was. Uh, anyway, what we had target. We had, more, we had far more familiar, look, familiar looking starships with the Titan A, clearly inspired by the movie era Constitution class Enterprise. Uh, we knew going into the season that the entire main crew would return and as the show went on we were treated to more easter eggs than cetacean observations could really handle. Something else I hate. Cetacean ops. Cetacean observations is a Sean Ferrick thing, that's what he, I think he just misspoke and he's stuck with it. Um, uh, cetacean ops, I just... All because of Star Trek Four, we decided somebody on, um, I think it were on um, uh, uh, um, an Enterprise D... Um, what they call it, uh, schematic, put cetacean ops. And everybody, for somebody fell in love with it. I thought, no, give over. <sighs> anyway, whatever, it's done. Uh, all of our dreams came true, you'd think. The discussion online in the aftermath of the season has been va have been varied. Uh, there are those who only view it as the true Star Trek sequel since Enterprise. It is the best, in my opinion. Since Enterprise. Once a true, but it is the best. Oh, pardon me. Fueling cries for Star Trek Legacy to be greenlit, because that's what Teddy Metallus said he had in mind. He, he came up with the name. Uh, following the crew of the Enterprise G. Didn't like that. I didn't like that they changed the name of the Titan A to the Enterprise G. That takes away all of Titan A's accomplishments. They should have made a new Enterprise to replace the, um, the Enterprise F, which will be, you know, um, um, decommissioned. Uh, should, have, for, should have had a new ship, a totally new design. Um, that's what they should have done. Instead of just painting Enterprise G, um, well, NCC 1701G, uh, onto the hull of the USS Titan. Shouldn't have done that. And I don't know why he did it. I honestly don't know why. I'm sure he's got his reasons, but anyway. Then there are those who feel it rely too heavily on nostalgia, sacrificing logic to suit the adventure. Uh, there's some plot holes and stuff in the season um, that it didn't answer. Um, you know, where did the bad gal... Uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, where did she get her ship from? The uh, Shrike. Where did she get that from? I'm never told. Don't know. Um, why did... Spoilers! The bad guys are changelings, uh, and then Borg later on. But whatever. Um, bad guys are changelings uh, that have been faffed with by Section 31. Uh, so they're slightly different to the uh, Gamma Quadrant changelings, though that's where they're originally from. Um, but why, why did some of them... Why would the head changeling look like she did? Essentially human. Why were uh, all the other changelings that were with her why were they like these alien that just made bird-like noises? I don't know. It never explained this stuff. But anyway, that's why it doesn't get a super high score from me. Because uh, there are too many unanswered questions, which is common in new Star Trek. They don't explain things. Um, things just happen, and you've got to accept it. Rather than explaining stuff or pointing something at in proper Star Trek, in classic Trek, something had happened and somebody would say, Well, why has that just happened? Or why didn't hap that happen? Or etc. Usually, not, not every time, but usually, things will be explained um, satisfactorily. Usually. But that never seems to happen in New Trek. Things just happen and you've got to cope with it. Some might say that's more realistic, but I don't, because that means it's not Star Trek. Because Star Trek's not realistic, it's fiction, remember, and fiction 
um, and uh, has to have you know, um, very similitude, that word again. Where were we? Uh, still others felt it suffered a lack of imagination and yet more had serious concerns over the themes of family and identity that were presented. Picard's third season is one of the most discussed seasons of Trek in years for all of the above and more. Now over a year since its airing, the calls for legacy seem to be falling on deaf ears just because it's Alex Kurtzman that's in charge and he doesn't want legacy to happen. He wants his bloody Starfleet Academy thing to happen. Because <sighs> that's his baby. Because he's an idiot. While the creative team have begun to move away and uh, book other work, it is an oddity in Trek history at once beloved and decried by a fandom that, if nothing else, certainly engaged with it. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Like I say, I enjoyed Star Trek Picard Season 3 for what it was. It wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. If you're, if you're Robert Marbonnet or Gary from Nerdrotic, it's like the second coming. The way they're going about it, it wasn't that good, in my opinion. But it was better than what we'd had. And it was the best Star Trek on TV since Enterprise, in my opinion. Right, moving on, number six. Uh, comedy in Star Trek. I don't mind a bit of comedy in Star Trek, to be completely honest. Uh, as long as it's well placed and well done. Which is why I originally didn't like uh, Lower Decks, because I didn't like its comedy at the time. I thought it were, were making fun of Star Trek. Um, and I've come to find that's not true. Uh, and I was mistaken about that. Um, it's much like, um, I was thinking of it in the same vein as I think of uh, Third Rock, not Third Rock from the Sun, um, the other one, um, Big Bang Theory. Um, I hate that show, Big Bang Theory. Everybody's saying, oh, it's a comedy, it's for nerds and geeks. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. You know, it's celebrating geek culture. No, it's not. It's making fun of geek culture. Because uh, none of them are geeks and nerds in that show. They're all Hollywood, um, beautiful people, pretending to be geeks and nerds. But anyway, that's by the by. Anyway, here we are, it's from um, Star Trek uh, Insurrection, uh, a film which I don't mind. A lot of people, it's, it's probably the least of the, in my opinion, of the next generation films. Uh, I like Nemesis better. Most people think Nemesis is the worst one, but I think Insurrection's the worst one. Um, but it does have some, some problems, but... On the whole, I do kind of enjoy it. Um, the effects, some of the effects are terrible in Insurrection for some reason. But uh, anyway. Right, San Diego Comic Con 2024 saw the announcement of a new live action comedy series set in the 25th century. The show is being developed by Tony Newsom and Justin Simeon, focusing on a group of Federation outsiders who discover they have been filmed and shown to the wider galaxy without their knowledge in an almost reality TV setting. Oh, I didn't know that. This is the first I've read about that. Uh, I didn't know we knew what we're going to be going, to be going on with it, but... Um, Anyway, um, so that sounds interesting for a start. It'll be like The Office, won't it? That's what it'll be like. Um, which will be interesting. Lots of uh, glances into camera, you know, something awkward happens. That's what I imagine it'll be like. Anyway, from the moment the news broke, the typing began. Comedy has a strange history in Star Trek. Clearly, it has been present since the, since the franchise's earliest days. But this was sometimes more piecemeal than others. Then, of course, there were episodes like The Trouble with Tribbles, Cupid... Uh, that's not Q, comma, Pid, it's Q, dash, Pid, whatever. The Magnificent Ferengi, among others. The announcement of Lower Decks, however, more, was met with trepidation. It had the double whammy, it was a comedy while also being animated. The first animated Star Trek since the original animated series in the 70s. What did this mean for the franchise? In Lower Decks' case, it meant five seasons and a live-action crossover, which I really liked in Strange New Worlds. Uh, the announcement now of a live-action, purely comedic series has been met with some extreme reactions. You know what, I think it might have been that live-action crossover with Strange New Worlds that kind of changed my mind about Lower Decks. Because I didn't like it. And um, I'd made up my mind I didn't like it. And then I watched that live-action crossover and I thought, well, these maybe they're interesting characters. And I, it was suggested to me to give it another go. So I did, and I ended up falling in love. And it's my favourite of the new Treks now. So there we go. So we, you know, we can change our minds. 
forgot where I worked now. Anyway, I'll start again from here. The announcement now of a live-action, purely comedic series has been met with uh, with some extreme reactions. Some commenters have come out strongly in favour of it, saying that the franchise has grown sufficiently to make room for a series such as this. Conversely, there are those who have seen the words reality TV and felt a sick swoop of worry sinking into their gut. I think that would work better than um, just like a sitcom, you know. The film Star Trek the comedy series is filmed in front of a studio audience. You know, we don't want to see that, do we? Uh, canned laughter. I hope there ain't going to be canned laughter in it. <laughs> That'd be terrible as well. But um, I think the reality TV, the office style, I think that's the way to go, to be completely honest. Um, are we looking at Star Trek Below Decks? What would that even look like? The reactions seem to tie back into the question of comedy in Trek. Is the franchise a serious endeavor? A, seri- a serious endeavor with moments of levity? Is it a dramedy, marrying both genres in equal measure? I imagine that's what it'll be like. It'll have, it'll be like a comedy, but there'll be some serious undertones going on in there as well. I bet there is. If that's so, where does in the pale moonlight fit into that description? What are you talking about? And the Pale Moonlight is just pure drama, isn't it? The DS9 episode. Anyway, this new series is sure to drum up a plethora of reactions while it remains in development. But will any of them answer the age-old question, what does Star Trek need with a comedy ship? It is, it's paraphrasing Star Trek V there. What does God need with a starship? What does Star Trek need with a... It's already had a comedy ship, Lower Decks. And as, as it said, it's... it's it's done comedy before, hasn't it? Um, and, and, you know, with varying degrees of success. But um, uh, we can only wait and see. I'm not sure it's going to happen. Um, I did a story recently, a video, at Tony Newsom, you know, I said that they've told her to keep writing, whoever they are, they have said keep writing. That doesn't mean it's going to get anywhere. So that means it's you know, still in... That phrase that's popped up recently, deep development. Uh, is it going to happen? Who knows? Who knows? But uh, we'll, we'll just we'll just have to wait and see. But we know that comedy can work in Star Trek. If done properly. Right, we'll move on. Number five. Right, number five is actors versus characters. Right, we'll see, see what's going on here. That's obviously William Shatner as uh, Admiral James T. Kirk. It looks like it's from Star Trek. Four, don't it? Right, with uh, which also did comedy. Star Trek Four did some good comedy uh, in its serious topic. Anyway, while each entry on this list is not only a serious topic but has been considered in a serious manner, this is an entry that concerns a topic that has brought genuine upset to members of the fandom. What does one do when they discover that an actor they felt represented one thing actually doesn't represent that at all? Don't know what they're gonna. I don't know what he's gonna say here, but anyway, in recent years, because Sean Ferrick is very much on a certain side, a, polit- a certain political side. I'm not gonna say which, because I don't give a monkeys. But um, I think he's gonna say that's the right side, if you know what I mean. Not not the right, the correct side. But we'll see. I don't know. I could be wrong. In recent years, the question of politics, of the politics of Star Trek actors, has played into more and more conversations in the fandom. This is by no means unique to this particular fandom either. Politics, as it had been described by many other writers, more qualified than I, Sean Ferrick, used to be dull. Say what you like for it now, it isn't dull anymore. Yeah, it is. That naturally will deep, will deep into how one engages. What are you talking about? Don't know. And that one engages with the content presented. Uh, I've no idea what he's talking about there. Seep. Maybe that naturally will seep into how one engages with the content presented. I have no idea. Uh, whatever. It has become increasingly topical to discuss an actor's, or any member of the production for that matter, politics and stance on certain civil issues. LeVar Burton spoke out about consequence culture, believing it to be a more useful endeavour than cancel culture. Uh, several Trek... Uh, cancel culture is a terrible thing. Um, I talk at consequence culture can be, I suppose, but, you know, but we've all, there's got to be consequences for everything you do, aren't there? Some people say some things without thinking of the consequences. Uh, on both sides of the political aisle, 
Several Trek actors have evoked strong feelings in the fandom through the years, ranging from Trek's earliest faces to its newest. While social media can be a microcosm of the world at large, um, I think so social media these days is just the world at large. It's not a microcosm. Uh, it is also a forum where the fans can engage with these performers directly, uh, which is a bad thing, in my opinion. Yeah. And an, an old phrase springs to mind, never meet your heroes, exactly. Never meet your heroes. Uh, I'll always be prepared to be disappointed <laughs> with your heroes. Anyway, clearly there is a negative connotation to that, assuming that they will always disappoint you. However, the opposite is also true. There can be so much more than what we see on screen, which can ironically also affect how one engages with the content. But that depends if they agree or disagree with your... I won't say political, but it, with your world view. Uh, this is a topic that is likely to become more prescient. Oh, this was obviously done before the elections. Um, with the US elections of 2024, as well as the cacophony of once-in-a-lifetime events throughout the world. The sad fact is that it is very likely that more Star Trek actors will disappoint the fans in some way. You know, such as Marina Sirtis, with her nonsense talking about how, like, the hurricanes... I think she said, didn't it? Um, people dying in, uh, I think it was Texas, wasn't it, of, of that, you know, the hurricanes and tornadoes and stuff. Um... Um, they deserved it because they voted for Donald Trump or something along those lines. Unbelievable. Um, the question, that's you know why you, you, you kind of fall out with some people. I don't, I've never been a fan of Marina Sirtis, to be completely honest. She's, she's gorgeous to look at, but I've never been a real fan of her and I don't think she can act for Toffee. She can act better than me because she's an actress, but... <sighs> She was, she was the, the eye candy. <laughs> of, and that's all she was, of TNG, and she can't accept that. But uh, Tough. The question for which there's no easy answer, in to what extent do we absorb it? Um, as in, actors are people, aren't they? When all said and done, they're adult pretenders. Um, they make believe for a living. Um, and because... The thing with actors is because it's their way of life, what they do for a living, uh, acting, pretending, being over-emotional at the drop of a hat, because that's what they've got to do, they've got to over-emote, um, that kind of leaks into their everyday life as well, and they'll often say things and do things that seem inappropriate to, you know, uh, the general public. Um, so that's why they sometimes say things, you think, oh God, why did you have to say that? Um, you're just gonna, you're just gonna set people off, uh, which they often do on both sides. Anyway, but that's politics for you. That's politics. Right, moving on. Number four. Right, sixties racism. What's Klingons got to do with racism? Don't know. Because Klingons come in all shapes and sizes. Well, not shapes. Well, you're kind of shapes. Come in all. Cause they look different from episode to episode, apart from the clothes. Um, as I said, these. This is Michael and Sarah as Kang, is it Kang, uh, with his with his wife and the Klingons from his ship. This is the day of the dove in it, this episode, where we ended up with Klingons on the Enterprise. Um, and these were more dark-skinned Klingons, as you can see. They're obviously... Is this what they're talking about? The black-faced them? Is that what they're saying in this? I don't know. I should read it, shouldn't I? Just shut my fat gob. Right, off we go. The Klingons have never really been ones to shy away from controversy. Controversy particularly when it comes to a spot of genocide. We're not even joking. Errand of Mercy saw Kor give the order to execute a large group of Organians. Uh, Wakar William Campbell. Or oh, Wakar... I get mixed up. Um, oh, I forgot his name now. Uh, that were in Battlestar Galactica. Um, played um, Bolta in the original Battlestar Galactica. Um, John Colicos. Um, I can't remember which were which. I get mixed up. Uh, it was hardly his fault they were non-corporeal, was it? Oh, sorry, it was hardly his fault they were non-corporeal, was it? The Klingons, as the films went on, became more alien with the addition of forehead ridges. Uh, this was thanks to a budget bump, uh, you know, in the, the motion picture, which at the time was the most expensive movie ever made. Um, and they were originally supposed to have, like, tentacle fingers and stuff, weren't they? Which they kind of brought back-ish 
in Discovery. The, the, the Discovery aliens were more or less based on the motion picture original design um, for the Klingons, much like the USS Discovery were based on the original design for the, the refit USS Enterprise. Anyway, from the motion picture, or Star Trek Phase 2. Anyway, this was thanks to a budget bump and was something Gene Roddenberry claimed would have been the case since day one had their re the resources. Uh, though the Klingons of the movies, the next generation and beyond, would use more prostheses to complete their look, although they did vary in styles because they had different makeup artists doing them. Uh, in the movies and in TNG. TNG, well, Michael Westmore. Uh, I think in the movies, I don't know if they were all the same, but I think they had different, you know, people coming and designing the Klingon foreheads. So some of them they still had bumps, but some of them were more smooth bumps, if you know what I mean. Like the Colonel Worf from um, Star Trek VI, supposed to be TNG Worf's granddad. His, his forehead looked nothing like Worf's, but anyway. <sighs> well, well, we did, 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 did. The Klingons of the original series had no such adornments as in bumpy foreheads. Uh, John Colicos fam famously workshopped the idea for what Carl would look like when he arrived to receive his makeup and realised no one had any idea what a Klingon should be. Therefore, they used liberal amounts of Orient shaded makeup and gave him a Fu Manchu moustache. This would look. This would effectively be the template for every other Klingon in the series, with successive warriors becoming increasingly darker in tone. While William Campbell was very fair as Koloth. Oh, there we go. So John Colicos was Kor, William Campbell was Koloth. Uh, Michael Ansara is clearly caked in paint as Kang, which makes the Day of the Dove an uncomfortable rewatch in the modern era. So he can't say blackface, can he? <laughs> which is essentially the what? But uh, anyway. However, there are those who argue online that as these actors were playing aliens and clearly not parodying people of colour nor the minstrel shows that so widely showed blackface, showcase blackface, oh, I do say it there, uh, that this doesn't actually count. Don't, don't forget, let that be your final battlefield, does it? Let this be your final battlefield. Uh, just putting that out there, I hate that episode. Then there are those who believe that this look, well-intentioned as it may have been, is a product of a bygone era and should therefore remain. This topic frequently rears in the cosplay community. Are original series Klingons OK to portray in 2024? Of course they are. Depending on who you ask, there remains a vocal part of the communi community who argue that Star Trek, a series known for pushing equality, would never knowingly use blackface to degrade anyone. Um, well, no, but, but, but it wouldn't knowingly do it, but it still might do it, <laughs> like unintentionally. Um, you know, it's like your, your your grandparents or whatever saying something racist. They don't realise they're saying it, do they? Um, but um, anyway, whatever. Um, well, well, it, uh, is this an argument that will die down as more and more examples of different Klingons appear? Or is it one that will remain loud and poignant uh, as those 60s Klingons are in our memories forever? I don't think the 60s Klingons are, are racist, to be completely honest. Um, you could argue that they look like, you know, every race on Earth. Because there's different shades of Klingons and different, with different... Like I said, he's just got a normal beard and moustache. Um, so has he, really. Um, but... Um, and they're all shaped, all colours. Well, we've seen all colours of Klingons, haven't we? Like these are darker skinned Klingons. We've seen lighter skinned Klingons. Um, so you could argue that they just kind of represent Klingons, much as we've got different, you know, people on the bridge of the Enterprise. We've got Sulu and Ahura and obviously Kirk and Spock, who's an alien. So there you go. So you could you could argue that, and I'm going to argue that that we just saw different variations of Klingons. Which is we see different variations of humans. Pardon me. So there we go. So I'm sticking up for 60s Klingons. There. Right, number three. We're getting there. Uh, woke, that word. Woke Trek, they've put there. Look, there's the uh, original um, series crew, which, um, which wasn't woke. Uh, in the modern definition of the word. Because originally woke meant you were just awake, you were aware 
of you know what was going down as the kids say uh, in the world um, means you knew you knew the score that's what work meant uh, and now it's changed now it's changed now now it means um, you're into um, over diversity and um, um, I, can't, I can't think of the bloody phrases now I'm blanking um, um, but you know what I mean you know you know what work work means anyway I'm sure they'll say in this article I, I'm babbling again aren't I Trek Culture is currently running a series of time does that mean time times Star Trek series oh time whatever that was me next time whatever Star Trek series went woke that's what they're on about with the original series and the next generation the word woke has seemingly lost its true meaning as I said and is often found to be tossed around as a shorthand for progressive liberal or simply representing anything that seems different from the norm not really, not really. Uh, these days, woke means, as I said, you know, over diversity, um, over equality, um, basically overdoing everything. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, each of the series that have been uh, released since Discovery have received this moniker uh, because it's true. Though perhaps Discovery most of all, which is, yes, especially true. The word woke has its origins in remaining awake to the injustices perpetrated by the authorities, with a particular focus on crimes committed against BIPOC people. Um, and don't ask me what that stands for. Because it probably, I think I know what it stands for, but it probably stands for something completely else. Um, I don't know. Black, indigenous people of colour. I have no idea. I have no idea what it means. I don't know. Therefore, this is one of the more puzzling debates. To decry something as woke seems like a compliment, highlighting that the episode or series is using its story to highlight modern-day issues. Sean Ferrick is very woke. I'm, I'm sorry, he is. He's a, um, we'll say he's a diverse man. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Lovely fella. I like watching his videos. But um, as I said earlier, he does stand on a certain side of an argument. Uh, or a political agenda. Anyway, like the original series did, Gene Roddenberry hid the contemporary issues that he was trying to discuss in the morality plays of the show, attempting to tackle such topics as racism, social inequality, bigotry, gender divide and class struggles, all within an hour, to in including adverts. This was no mean feat, nor can we say it, was always it always succeeded. There was, however, the attempt from the beginning to show a future that was free of such divisions as he saw in the world then. Um, well, yeah, that, that's it. That, that, and, and I think sometimes they, they, they over-egged their pudding somewhat. Let that be your final battleground. Oh, whatever the hell. I can never remember the name. Let that... that, that let that be your last battleground. That's what it is, isn't it? The one with the black on one side and white on the other, that one. With the Riddler in it. <laughs> anyway. I hate a terrible episode. And like I said, that's like crowbar in it, in it, it. But they did it well in other, in other episodes. Um, anyway. The recent Star Trek series have raised the ire of those who struggle with the diverse casts of Discovery and Strange New Worlds in particular. It's diverse at the expense of... I don't know, I'm just going to say it. The diverse at the expense of white men. Uh, straight white men. Let's put it that way. Okay, that's, I'm just going to leave it there. New Star Trek, you will rarely see straight white men. Obviously, there's some. But... Um, uh, or even straight white women, for that matter. <laughs> just saying it, I'm just putting it that way. The recent start was... Blah, 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 um, uh, they argue that the message was more subtle in the 60s. Yes, it was. While the counter-argument... Uh, apart from that episode. While the counter-argument goes that what was shown then was just as radical at the time as a gay couple brushing their teeth is today. Uh, that's not radical. A gay couple brushing their... They're talking about... Um, uh, oh, bloody forgot the names now. In Discovery, the, the, the gay, the doctor, and the engineer, uh, Stamets, and the gay doctor whose name I've forgotten. Wilson Cruz plays him. I remember his the actor name, but I can't remember his character name. Oh, it's gone. Um, no, that wasn't radical. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, don't mind that. It's other stuff. Like I say, it's the overcompensation that. that 
it don't bother me, um, even though I'm going on about it. But um, it, it it stands out. That's what I'm trying to say. It stands out. Um, but uh, anyway. To be fair, to those who attempt to solely discuss the difference in how television has changed in 60 years, they often get sucked into the argument against diversity, effectively killing constructive debate. Um, well, that's what he's trying to say now. He's, he's ending that, saying that I'm right, you're wrong. That's what he's saying there. So I'm sorry, Sean, I disagree with you there. Disagree with you there. Uh, it's overcompensation. That's what it is, in my opinion. But uh, Anyway. Less we say about that, the better. But uh, yes, be diverse, because St Star Trek was diverse. We had Sulu, there he is, and we had Uhura. Uh, we had a Scotsman played by a Canadian. We had a Russian played by an American, I think. I don't know. Where was Walter Koenig from? Is he American? Whatever. Uh, and another Canadian there uh, as the captain. So there we go. So it was diverse. Uh, for the 60s. Right, so, moving on. Let's get out of this one quick. Number two, what's number two? Uh, apologies, I've got to scroll each time. I forgot to scroll back to the top. <laughs> Gene's vision, and there's Gene Roddenberry. Uh, probably thinking about sex, because that's all he thought about. If you watch season one, which I am doing at the moment, for a video, uh, live stream, should I say, season one of TNG, it's all sex. It is all, no, not all of it, but you know, all the way through, sex, sex, sex. He's obsessed with the thing. Gene Roddenberry was a visionary, one who was also a savvy businessman. He tested the waters of what he could get away with in the 60s, pushing the boat farther than many of his contemporaries. Critiques levelled against the original series can sometimes come via a modern lens. However, well, obviously, you're going to compare things from then, whatever age it is, to now, whatever age you're living in. Ah, yeah, cause that's, that's what you naturally do, isn't it? However, when discussing what was featured in that show, one must also consider the censorship, the censorship of the day. Uh, the Dominion War inspired much debate over what Gene's vision was for the future. There were those who argued that big interstellar wars were antithetical to Gene's vision. I don't think so. So adverse were they to the idea of a utopia. Deep Space Nine as a whole has inspired many debates on what Starfleet truly is or what it must be uh, to remain the way it should be. Section 31 is another introduced idea in that show that seems anathema to his vision. How could Starfleet, of all things, have its own version of the CIA? It was worse than the CIA, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I agree with that he wouldn't have agreed with Deep Space Nine and Section 31. And, and probably the Dominion War story arc. But I think it would be wrong, because, uh, you know, it wasn't perfect. It was his thing. It's like saying George Lucas is right about everything in Star Wars. It's not true, is it? George Lucas can make some bad choices in, in his own thing that he's created. Uh, and the same was for um, Gene Roddenberry. Uh, but Star Trek wasn't just his, his thing. Um, it evolved, didn't it, over time? And a lot of the things in Star Trek, um, Starfleet, for instance, uh, and I think maybe even the Federation, weren't Gene Roddenberry's idea. They came from people like Robert Justman and Gene L. Coon, um, and others, Dorothy Fontana and all these. So, you know, it wasn't just Gene. Um, as important as he is, you know, he was the creator, the originator of it. Anyway, D Space Nine argued that the, the perfect idea of the future was very much the issue. This is easily seen as the main argument against how Gene did things. Gene wanted no conflicts at all in the future, specifically interpersonal drama between crewmates, which he kind of broke that rule. He did, to be honest, uh, many times in his own stuff. But uh, because how, you, you've got to have drama, it's a drama series, isn't it? So you've got to have interpersonal stuff going on from time to time uh, it's human isn't it there were humans is he trying to say they were all robots so it were wrong in that and they changed that didn't they when Michael Pillar came on to Next Generation in season 3 um, it was Michael Pillar's, that Michael Pillar's idea that it should be about the characters uh, and so we, we just start getting more interpersonal uh, relationships and stuff like that and drama and arguments um from season three and it became the better for it the better for it because 
the first two seasons, there were good episodes in the first two seasons of TNG. Bad mate, but it, it was very much an extension of the original series. Um, sometimes a bit stuffy, and sometimes a bit out there, and sometimes a bit of its time. Whereas from season three onwards, it kind of became timeless. I've said this before. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Gene, but once you were out of the way <laughs> and the rains had gone to other people, uh, I'm not saying once he died, I'm saying once he were relieved of his duties and became like just a figurehead, um, it became a better product, in my opinion. Anyway, right, where were we? The writers for The Next Generation have often spoken out against this edit, uh, bemoaning how difficult it made writing for a series. Deep Space Nine effectively threw this edit out the window, as it was the brainchild of Rick Berman and Michael Piller. Perhaps this contributed to the initial lower ratings for the show, removed as it was from Gene's ideals. Uh, but I don't think it was. That That's my thing. I think they the made a good balance. Uh, because even though they were dealing with uh, problematic things um, on Deep Space Nine. Um, they the tried to stick to, to, you know, the Star Trek ideals. Not because they said Gene Roddenberry's ideals, the Star Trek ideals, the Starfleet ideals. Anyway. Uh, in the intervening years, uh, it has been it has seen a reappraisal, now confident in its popularity. Gene purists argue that the original series and the next generation are Star Trek in its purest form, encapsulating Roddenberry's ideas and beliefs. While there are those, well, the first two seasons of TNG. <laughs> uh, while there are those who argue that without shows like Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, Discovery, and beyond, this version of the future is incomplete. Um, yes, I would agree with that last part, because, as I said, uh, Gene Roddenberry, you know, genius as he was, coming up with the idea in the first place, although some people say he just kind of took the uh, um, the crew of the uh, C-57D from Forbidden Planet and made that into Star Trek, which you could argue that, that it, that it, it, it inspired Star Trek. But anyway... Uh, yeah, so, you know, even though Gene Roddenberry were a genius and um, came up with the idea in the first place, as I said, notwithstanding Forbidden Planet and other stuff that had come before, but never mind, um, it, it were the, the ideals of Starfleet and the Federation, which weren't Gene Roddenberry creations, um, although some might argue that, but they weren't. Uh, it was Gene Roddenberry, I think, that came up with the United Earth Space Patrol Agents or Space Probe Agency, whatever the hell it was done for. Um... It were Earth humans, essentially, that were going out, even though they had Spock on board, um, that were going out and exploring. Not the Federation and not Starfleet. That came later. That came later in Season 1, didn't it? And it were others that came up with those ideas. But anyway, I'm, I'm babbling again. Um, I am a Gene Roddenberry fan, uh, but, you know, he wasn't the perfect man, was it? Much as George Lucas isn't the perfect uh, man, but he came up with Star Wars... Again, even though that's just based on Flash Gordon, Book Rogers, that sort of stuff. But anyway, but anyway, it's it's it is what it is now. So stop arguing about it. Right, number one. What's number one? Don't know. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Legacy. Right. Uh, does it mean Star Trek Legacy literally or something else? Right. And there's Tuvok, um, Captain Tuvok, uh, in season three. Of uh, Star Trek Picard. Right, anyone following uh, anyone following Star Trek on social media over the last year will have seen the calls for a Star Trek Legacy series to be commissioned by Paramount. Trek culture has been among them. We've even designed our own logo for the show. This, of course, has been inspired by the third season of Star Trek Picard, so this entry can be seen as an extension of that one. Yet this point is more specific. Legacy would, in a perfect world, follow the crew of the Enterprise G or another contemporary Starfleet vessel in the 25th century, because uh, that's when Tata Picard takes place, um, I think, 25, 2401, which is the 25th century. Nothing to do with Book Rogers, <laughs> unfortunately. Thus continuing the era of Star Trek that combines everything from the next generation to Prodigy. Legacy would serve, at least initially, a single purpose, nostalgia. While that isn't a reason not to do a thing, it cannot simply be the only reason. 
The an- the easy answer there, of course, is hire a good group of writers to create the stories for the show. Now, that begs the question, who would the fandom be happy with? Uh, a very vocal section of the audience wants to see Terry Metallus return to run the series. Uh, yeah, that would be a good choice. But he has recently been announced as the showrunner for Marvel's Vision series, so it's unlikely he would have the capacity to return. Uh, is this an all-or-nothing request? Alex Kurtzman serves as the head of Trek for Paramount. We could write an entire list on the debate over him. Uh, yes, you could, because he's an idiot. And he shouldn't be anywhere near anything, for, for uh, in my opinion. Uh, he is the kiss of death. Somehow, it's worked with him for Star Trek, but I think because Star Trek's such a massive franchise, um, it's just taking it longer to die under his stewardship. <sighs> and so would naturally be in charge. There are those who would welcome this and those who would cry foul. Yes, I'd cry foul. Just get rid of him. What is clear is that until the show is or isn't announced, there will be fan casts, both in front and behind the camera, that will make some people happy, piss others off, and continue the cycle of debate on and on again. You know the saying, the only worse, uh, the only worse thing than being talked about is not being talked about. Or the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Proofreading, thing of the past. Um, couldn't they think of a final one? They thought, well, well, we need ten debates, and they couldn't think of a, a tenth one, so they just went back to the Star Trek legacy again. <laughs> I thought they were going to talk about the legacy of Star Trek. What is the legacy of Star Trek as a whole? Not Star Trek legacy. Uh, but the legacy of Star Trek as a whole, in my opinion, is that we look forward to an optimistic view of humans in the future, that we do away with war and want on Earth, and we evolve as a species and become united, and we head out into space, not to conquer or destroy things, but to join up with other alien races uh, and become part you know, of a, a galactic alliance that we, in Star Trek, it's called the Federation, and, you know, and just go out and make humanity and the universe in general uh, better um, isn't that a good thing to wish for in this, this particularly in this day and age when nuclear conflict seems you know looming over our heads once again but anyway uh, so that's what I did would uh, think is Star Trek's legacy uh, you wouldn't think so with modern Trek because modern Star Trek has become very um, dark uh, Starfleet is often portrayed as the bad guy um, for some reason I don't know why but um, because you're not allowed for some reason in modern writing and not just in Star Trek in other things as well in modern writing since since 2016-ish um, they're trying to make the bad guys sympathetic you know, they've always got to have a reason to be the bad guy uh, and sometimes you just want a bad guy to be a bad guy, you know, an antagonist to defeat um, or to outwit, uh, not necessarily to destroy, but just to, you know, to uh, overcome. Uh, but that seems that that's not that doesn't happen anymore. That doesn't happen anymore. And, and now we've got more, you know, um, problematic good guys and um, sympathetic bad guys. What's going on? I don't know. But anyway. I'm waffling. That's that's the legacy of modern Star Trek. Um, but uh, so there we go. So that was the top ten uh, Star Trek debates that tear the fandom apart. Uh, I won't go that far, uh, although some of the debates have torn the fandom apart. The woke debate, for instance, the over diversity, the um, uh, overuse. Of I don't know. I suppose you could say over equality. I don't. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to say it in in diplomatic terms, but uh, probably fairly miserably because I'm old. Much as I said, you know, old people tend to say racist things without realising it. Although I'm, I'm trying not to. Or other East film things. Uh, again, I'm rambling. Right, we'll leave that list there <laughs> before I dig a hole for myself and get myself into trouble. Which I probably already have. But there we go. Right, so we'll leave that there. Yeah. So, I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, list. I, I wish I'd never done it now, to be completely honest. But uh, it is what it is. <laughs> so, 
Uh, once again, don't forget to like and subscribe and share and drop a comment and all that stuff. Tell me what an idiot I am in the comments. It usually happens anyway. And uh, explore the description for all those various links and become a member and all that stuff. Um, and uh, you'll see this video earlier than the members of the general public who won't. Who will have to wait. Uh, that is what it is. Right, so thanks for watching. And wherever you are, look after each other. And until next time, I'll see you there.